<laughs> so, I'm going on to chapter um, six here. Now, you know, we're in a time crunch. Okay? We're in a time crunch. So, I'm going to do something that you're probably not going to do. And I apologize in advance, but let me show you. When you go to the website, just <coughs> like right here, you get to practice that one. Okay? So that's the only practice exam that you're going to get from me. And I'm thinking about not for you. I'm thinking about Monday going right to this chapter. Because if I don't do that, that means we got to have two Saturday lectures as of right now. And I'm just going to try to catch up. Now let me tell you, you do not have to come to those Saturday lectures. You'd be a fool if you didn't come. Because I assume they're going to be toward the end of the semester when things get a lot more challenging. And, and I'm thinking if I cut one loss just by reviewing, not reviewing, because what am I going to review? I mean, am I just going to sit up here and do mesh and no? You guys know all of the techniques. If you have all of the techniques, that means then you just got to practice them. Okay? You just got to practice those techniques. Now, that being said, I'm, I think that's the best alternative to that. Do you have any other options? I'm listening. Yes. So this is just stop the only thing I want to No. I would love for it to be on the exam. But it's not. So when you look at that practice exam, there's one problem that's there that shouldn't be there now. There's an op amp problem on that exam. So obviously I wouldn't put that on the exam. Okay? So here we go. Let's talk about this op amp chapter. Now, let's talk about. So we are now in chapter six here. And it's on operational <coughs> amplifier. So when we talk about operational amplifiers here, they typically don't call them operational amplifiers. They typically call them operators. And there's only one type of op-amp that we're going to be dealing with. The type of op-amp that we're going to be dealing with here is specifically what's known as a micro uh, 741. And this is a voltage-controlled voltage source. And so when I look at this voltage-controlled voltage source, we typically think of a voltage-controlled voltage source looking like a diamond shape, and then either looking like this, or it's looking like that. I'm sorry, I should not have done that. It's like this. But that's not the way they're drawn. And what you're going to see here is that the 741 here What's special about this guy here is that it has six pins, as I'll show you. And the way we draw them is we draw them in diamond shape. And I'm going to encourage that we use this sign polarity, where the minus is always on top, the positive is always at the bottom. And what you're going to find here is that there's really three main pins. Okay. So when you look at a voltage-controlled voltage source, what do you have? You have some gain, and then you have the controlling voltage. So the question is, what is the controlling voltage in this case here? It turns out that they typically name the negative pin, they call it V1, and then the uh, positive pin, they call it V2, and everything is always measured relative to the ground. And so when I look at this voltage controlled voltage source here, we could say that this guy is going to be equal to whatever you put out. So what's the controlling voltage? In this case here, the controlling voltage is Vn equals to V1 minus V2. 
What's the output voltage? It turns out that the output voltage is this guy, V out. So how do I measure these? They're always measured relative to the ground. Always relative to the ground. And you're going to see that this ground gets really loose here. We don't draw a straight line. You're going to see that when we say ground, what do we mean by ground? The ground floor, right? We could call this the ground floor. We could have different types. We could have the height of the desk. We could have, have the height of this lectern table. We could have the height of that guy. But everything is measured relative to that. So what you'll see here, it's not uncommon to do this. You could write this guy, so this will be V1, and then they'll say, oh, it's measured relative to the ground right there. And then you could have pin V2, and then they'll say, oh, it's measured relative to that. And then you could have V out, and then we say, oh, out is measured relative to this point right here. So these grounds are loose. We don't have to have a full line connecting them. We know that they're connected. Because that is what we mean as zero volts. So you just want to be careful here, is if you see problems where you're seeing me drop the lines, well, it's still relative to the ground no matter what I say. So what's special about this guy here is that now we see that V out has to be equal to A V in, where V in is then the difference between V1 minus V2. And that's what we mean by a voltage controlled uh, voltage source. And one more thing here, this gain has a maximum that it could actually have. And you'll see that the gain uh, is somewhere between minus 10 to the 5, right? I think that's right. To A, the gain, which is plus 10, 10 to the 5. So it has a gain of about 100,000. So if you could imagine here something like this. So if I use a voltage control uh, voltage source, one of the things that you can see here is it could be something like this. If I have a sensor, like you have in the physics lab, or maybe you're using PASCO, PASCO may produce a very small voltage with its force sensor. Let's say it produces a voltage of, let's say, maybe 10 to the next, 10 uh, microvolts. So if I take this through an amplifier like this, then they'll give it a gain of 100,000, so all of a sudden, instead of it being of the order of, you know, 10 microvolts, it's of the order of about a volt, or less than a volt. And that's what that gain would actually tell me. So, so that's what I mean by this range. So you're essentially maximally gain, having a gain of 100,000, even if I have these small volts. So I guess you could, in theory, if I had a perfect amplifier, would mean that I could gain one volt to 100,000 volts. But that, that's a pretty scary thought. And I, and, a, and I don't think that's even possible, as far as I understand. Now, what we see here is that when you look at this 741, this is what the chip looks like. So I'm going to pull this down so that we can look at it in detail. So what you're seeing here is that it looks like this. Okay. So first of all, the very first thing that you've got to do with the amplifier is that you've got to power it up. The way you power it up here is that you connect the, um, the off amp with a voltage of negative 15 and positive 15. Okay? So you have to do that. So what you'll find here is that when you do that, then, you, then there are only three important pins. 
There's pen number two, pen number three, and pen number six. Okay? After I put power, you always got to have power of the op amp. Always. So then, what you find here is that you can see that there's a sort of like little divot here. Some op amps have it and some op amps don't. And But you'll typically see here that if they don't, they'll have still this little circle to tell you what the top is. So you can see that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you can see that these, the, these two are the input voltage. That is the output voltage. And what you're going to find here is that this op amp has, um, has some limitations. It has three limitations which we will go after in the lab. You'll see that in Friday's lab we're going to go after two limitations. One that's known as voltage saturation and current saturation. And then there's something called a slew rate, which we'll go after spring break when we come back and start messing around with the oscilloscope a lot more. By the way, I think, yeah, the feminine lab is the last DC lab that we will do. Actually, this is a DC lab. That's not true. This week's lab is the last DC lab that we will do. After this, everything has to be AC. So what we're going to be looking at here is that this is what we find here. The op amps must be powered by power supply. So when I look at the op amp here, you're looking at something like this here. You're going to see on this side here, there's a pin number two. On this side here, there's a pin number seven. And so what happens here is that you're literally going to come in here and you're going to put, in this case here, you're going to put a negative 15 volt source here. So note, the fact that I have that positive connected to the ground implies that that's a negative 15 value. So this is negative 15 volts. And then on this pin here, you're going to have a positive 15 voltage source. So if I look at this guy, this guy gives me a positive 15 volts. It must always be there. Okay? In fact, it makes zero sense to talk about the op amp without these power supplies being there. So what we do then is that we assume that they're always there. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ignore them. If I ignore them, I still have these pins here. So if I ignore them, this is exactly the same as this guy right here. But I'm ignoring the power supplies. So what you're seeing here is that I'm ignoring power supply input and R not drawn. But they're always there. So here we go. So what we want to find here is that there are three limitations to the uh, op amp. So the first one is called voltage saturation. And I probably, I don't know what I call this, probably Vsat or something, I don't know. So when I look at this voltage saturation, <coughs> What we find here is that the saturation goes something like this here. So when I look at this op amp, what's super important about this thing here is that this must be linear. So when I write the solution for the, the op amp here, we see that the op amp A, B, N, this implies that you have a linear behavior. 
what do I mean by linear behavior? So what happens here is that if I come in and I plot V out versus V in, you can see that if A is a constant, I should have a slope that should be linear. Right? Linear behavior implies um, constant slope. And what's that slope supposed to be? It's supposed to be that A. So A, excuse me, has to be that slope value. But note, it can also go in the negative direction. And when you go in the negative direction, it should also have that linear slope here. So the question is, how much can I keep the op amp of having that linear slope? And what it comes down to is that power supply. You have to look at this power supply, and you have to look at this limitation of the gain here. As long as you're within this range, what you'll find here is that as soon as I reach the value of 15 volts, it turns out that this sets the limitation right here. And so if I try to increase my output more than what my power supply is doing, then you, we hit this rail, as we would say. And so what do we say? That at this time right here, this, we find here, is that the op amp is voltage saturated. It cannot go above the gain. And the same thing happens when I try to go in the negative direction, that negative 15 sets that. So if I get to negative 15 volts, then you'll see that at this one point here, this guy will come in and it would hit this rail again and it reaches a maximum of negative 15 volts. So I could saturate it at 15 volts or negative 15 volts. And you'll see in lab here that this is not exactly 15. And you'll see that there's really not a symmetry between these two. And I won't talk about that right now, but I'll let you see that in lab here. So as long as you are between the power supply voltages right here, assuming that the op-amp can handle that voltage, then you will have linear behavior from what the op-amp can possibly do here. So that's one limitation. Another limitation here has to do with curve saturation. So if I look at current saturation, I could be, I'll define this like this here. And you'll see that in the offense, it's saturated. I, I, I don't remember what it is, but I know it has to be somewhere between, I think, uh, 20 to about 30 million. Somewhere between that range here. So what do I mean by a current saturation? Well, let's, let, let me give you an analogy for this, and I think that might be the best thing to go about it. So if I think about an analogy here, imagine that I have a power supply that produces 10 volts. And I have a resistor that has some value here, and I'm going to make this resistor a variable because I'm going to hook it up to a decade resistor box. Now, Let's say that I can change this variable resistor to any value that I like here. So let's say I click in here, 1. So if I have 1, then I'm going to get what? 10 amps. If I click this to half an ohm, I'm going to get 20 ohms. If I click this to a tenth of an ohm, I get 100 amps coming out of this thing here. Now, is that realistic? So if you look at the power supplies that we have in the lab, what's the maximum current that they're producing? I think it's, what, 5 amps. That's the maximum. So what happens here is that if I keep turning this resistor down and down and down, there's a limitation of how much current 
I can get out of this power supply. So if these power supplies can't produce an infinite amount of current, guess what? You're not going to get an infinite amount of current. So what happens here is that when you have the op-amp, so in a very analogous way here, so that the power supply is limited in how much current it can supply. At some point here, it's not going to be able to supply any more, right? And one example here, as an example, just to remind you on your notes here, if I set R variable to a tenth of an M, a tenth of an ohm, this would imply that the source has to put out 100 amps. Not realistic. Okay? We would say that it's not possible. Now, no, there are power supplies that you can put out 100 amps, but not the lab ones, at least. So now, here's the same thing. I have an op-amp. And what do I have? I have power supplies. So when you're looking at the total current here, we have to look at how much current can these power supplies actually put up. And so what we typically do here is that we measure the current coming from the output. So typically what they do here is that, you know, they'll have the current coming this way, but in this case, let's say that the current's coming out here. So I'll call this I current because it's related to the output. So what you're seeing here is that if I take this resistor and I reduce this value, what's going to happen now? If I keep reducing this value, it's sort of like this type of thing. And so what ends up happening is that if I reach this saturation level on the op-amp, what ends up happening is that the this op-amp stops behaving linearly. It will not follow this linear line here. So what we say then, so that when I saturation is reached, this implies here that the op-amp stops uh, acting linearly. So, that means that it won't follow this path. That gain won't be linear anymore. Now, there's a third one here that's called the slew rate. And I'm going to say, I'm going to save till later in lab. We're not going to use this right now. It only makes sense if you're talking about AC. So I'll just leave it right there. So I won't go into those details. So what we want to do now is we want to go in and we want to look at the op-amp. And you're going to see that the op-amp is a fairly complicated device beyond the scope of this course. Now if you were to take you know, the next course and, and circuits here, you'll see that it's not as challenging as it appears. But for our intensive purposes, we're not going to do that. So one of the things that I wanted to show you here, if you go online and you just say, tell me about you know, what does the op-amp actually really look like? It looks something, it looks something like this here. So the actual op-amp inside looks like this. And then that looks kind of scary. It, it's actually not as scary as it looks. If you just spend some time 
understanding a little bit more, you'll see that that that's what's inside. But you know what? We don't care in this course. What do we care about? We care what's called an effective model of the object. Okay? So that effective model is known as the ideal op-amp model. Okay. So if you look at the ideal op-amp model, it turns out to be quite simple. So the ideal op-amp model essentially has two conditions. And this is, not, this is a little bit strange. I'm going to tell you. It's a little bit strange. And so the first condition of this model here is it says that the input current, I should say not the input terminal current, In other words, I1 equals I2, which is 0. That's one of the conditions. And another one is that the node voltages at the input are equal. V1 equals V2. That's the model right there. Okay. That's the model. And I, let me just kind of tell you why you might find this really strange. Remember how what we said about the linear behavior. An op-amp has what? It follows this equation, or it has the input right there. Right? That's what a voltage control voltage source is. But wait a minute, let's write this just one more time, but in detail. And I just want to remind you that we're saying that V1 is equal to V2, so the input is zero, so you're going, but wait a minute. If the input is zero, the output has to be zero. As we would say, no. <laughs> right? And one of the things that you would find, that you'll find here, is that you have to look, we have to go more deeper into the op amp to actually explain what do I mean by this condition here. And I'll just say it in passing here, and if there's enough time at the end, which there will not be, okay? But the important thing is that there's what's called a feedback resistor. And that feedback resistor sets up a negative feedback system in the op amp. And what I mean by that here is that when you look at the op amp, you have, yes, you have V2 and you have V1 and you have V up. And what's important here is that there's a sec there's a resistor or, or a system that does what? It comes in. And this is typically called the feedback line or the feedback resistor. And so what they'll say here is that this is the feedback <coughs> resistor here. And what that does here is that there's information that is transferred between here and here effectively. And what I mean by a negative feedback system Is that it does what? If 
I put an input that does the output, so if I have a system that this is communicating, as soon as these two resistors try to change voltage, the, the difference between these two, this feedback system has to come back and do what? Try to keep them the same. So in this system, you're working to always keep these two together here. 